everyone. Uh, let's uh, get started. Okay, so last time uh, we finished with uh, explaining how pre-training and post-training works by these organizations who develop large language models that we all use after they have been uh, created and uh, made available for us. But we somehow didn't end up really on a celebratory note. I don't know, like, I feel like this is a big moment in this class. Now you have learned what large language models are, what the key ingredients of producing a large language models um, uh, is. And um, so, yeah, I wanted to stop here and kind of acknowledge that we have came to that point where you more or less understand to the po uh, what something like ChatGPT is to the extent possible, right? We don't have a very, we don't have code for ChatGPT or a very clear uh, paper that describes all the procedure, but more or less ChatGPT was created uh, by having those uh, stages, pre-training instruction, uh, fine tuning, uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback, and, um, and that's it. So kind of exciting, I would say. Um, but I do feel like that uh, today my original plan was now to tell you how can we extend these models to also handle many languages, like 100 languages, not just English. Or you might have experienced that if you give an image to ChatGPT and ask questions about it, it will be able to address those, right? So how what had happened to extend you know, basic large language models as we have you know, seeing them so far in this course to other languages and other modalities like vision. However, I feel like some things are not really clear to you right now. So I changed the plan a little bit and I wanna go over a few things I deem are still kind of confusing to you. And it's really important for me that this is not confusing anymore and that we are all on the same page about this stuff. So I will go over certain things again, uh, and, and then we'll see uh, where does this get us. And depending on the time, I will talk about uh, multilingual and multimodal models. Or uh, if not, if we don't have time for that, that's okay. Let's use the time today to really try to you know, address any kind of uncertainties or questions you have about the content so far. Uh, and then I can, I will probably then, um, use some of the time I initially saved for interpretability, for example, to cover multilingual and multimodal stuff, because uh, as I mentioned before, I teach explainability of large language models and there are recordings for all of those things and you can check those uh, if you wanna know more, although it would be nice to, that I give you kind of high level overview. So today, the goal is to make sure that we all understand different architecture types and how large language models are used Please ask me questions, interrupt me anytime you have any doubts and let's uh, make any everything clear that that's not so far. Okay, so I will start with just going over quickly over those three stages. So we have pre-training stage, which takes large corpus. Uh, this corpus, as Kyle had mentioned, has 10,000 gigabytes of data, so enormous corpus of text that is mostly composed from the internet data by taking a snapshot of common Chrome. But it has data like GitHub, so a bunch of code that we all make available on GitHub, uh, papers from Archive, uh, Wikipedia, Reddit uh, posts, uh, and so on. And here we are using the uh, either pre-training, uh, uh, as a pre-training objective, it, today use language modeling, just predicting the next token. But remember you have learned about another pre-training objective, which is predicting the mass token that was popular in 2018 and is no longer super popular. Once that's done, we have learned that uh, we need to do so-called instruction fine tuning stage to be able to produce language models that are capable of following many instructions. Right, so in 2020, we had pre-trained language models like GPT-3 that were pre-trained only with the internet data, mostly internet data with the next token prediction, but those language models were incapable to address queries like, how can I um, write this in Python, write me um, bed bedtime story for with these characters and so on. So in this stage, we have this, uh, um, human labeled data mostly in 2020 especially was only human labeled data where you have various prompts that are 
of that type where you are giving a directive to do something and uh, some pretty good responses um, for that given prompt. In 2020, that was all just human authored academic data of 1800 tasks. Uh, today with LAMA 3.1, for example, which comes with a more detailed description of the what's, what has done uh, for to produce these large language models. Uh, we know that also here you will have generations of a language model to serve as responses. So it's gonna be mixed between human author and synthetic data. Uh, also, uh, something I didn't emphasize before, in 2022, we didn't care about chat yet. So instruction fine tuning was done in a multi-turn fashion. You have a prompt and you have a single response, and then you move on to another prompt and response. However, today, it's really important that these large language models have conversational capabilities. So instruction fine tuning today is done with the conversational data where you have multiple turns for initial prompt, which is, uh, which is important to, to know also. So once that done, then the creators of large language models move into alignment for safety, meaning preventing models from generating explicitly harmful text or text that will aid you in doing um, harmful illegal activities. And this is done, as we learned last time, by collecting um, data, by providing usually people with two generations for the same prompt and asking them which one they prefer more. And then we use these preferences to train a reward model that should give preferred generation higher score. Then we will use the rewards coming from the reward model to further fine tune our language model to produce next token, but in a fashion where we will suppress the high probabilities for tokens that would be associated with harmful text. Okay, so these are three stages. Uh, so in 2018, we had pre-training. In 2022, instructional fine tuning emerged. And then in uh, late 2020 and 2023, and also in 2024, we have uh, uh, fine tuning for safety with uh, RLHF or the variants like DPO that remove the uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, but you still use human feedback data. One thing that's super important to also uh, remember that these three phases are done by organizations like OpenAI, Google DeepMind, Meta, Anthropic, XAI, O1, AI, Alibaba, Mistral, AI2, Cohere, whatnot, right? So there are organizations who have more um, GPUs and they have uh, more engineers to handle this um, a little bit daunting task of a pre-training the language model. And this is what they do. So they do these three stages, one after the other. And us, we use these large language models to do something uh, after with them. So don't be confused with uh, thinking that uh, these three stages done on a large scale are something you are doing, okay? Uh, that said, if you have a language model and you want to use reinforcement learning from human feedback, given some data you have, and um, nothing stops you from doing that, right? So it's just not very common that there is need for that. Usually we just use the uh, already created large language models. Okay, so these three stages are large scalar experiments. Uh, as you can see here, we have trillion tokens. Here, the scale becomes smaller. So in theory, you could do instruction fine tuning in RLHF, but you need to have a good reason for doing it if already instruction fine tune and RLHF model exists. So you might have very particular purposes in mind to do that, and that would be fine, but usually you don't do it. What we do is we just take these language models and then uh, if they are proprietary, meaning their weights are not shared with the world to be downloaded and used, then we usually rely on APIs. So for example, ChatGPT or uh, Anthropics models like Cohere, you would use APIs, uh, that's all you have. And then uh, we can also prompt or fine tune uh, open weights, uh, large language models like Llama, Mistral, Quen, and so on. 
And usually if we are dealing with open weights, large language models, we will use hugging face ecosystem. I also want to remind you, and I hope this much is clear at this point, the main difference between prompting and fine tuning being that with fine tuning the model, we are changing the model weights. And with prompting, we do not change the model weights. We are trying to construct a nice prompt that will elicit uh, the model's capability to address a given prompt. Okay, so not changing the weights with uh, prompting is uh, important to know to be major difference with fine tuning. Okay, any questions so far? Very well. So this is a nice little visualization of a bunch of large language models um, that had appeared in, you know, up to 2023, uh, the round models that had appeared in our last year here. But what you can see in this visualization, there are these three distinctive branches and they are referring to encoder only transformer models. So here we have encoder only transformer language models. Here we have encoder, uh, decoder, transformer, pre-trained language models. And here this big branch is decoder only transformer uh, pre-trained models. And if this visualization continued uh, up to this date, this branch would just become longer and wider while all these two branches would you know, stay where they are and we wouldn't see many models. So I did say that decoder only models are way more popular these days. I didn't, I wasn't sure whether that point really landed. And I'm pretty sure that the difference between encoder only and decoder only models is still very fuzzy to you. So from here, remember that it's not just me saying, okay, uh, whether a transformer architecture is encoder only, decoder only, or decoder, decoder matters. It really matters because it, uh, it is a um, big choice that people make when they develop large language models. And it seems important to remember that some of these branches simply started to, you know, fade away. They, they, there aren't new uh, language model of uh, encoder only type, for example. Okay, so given that, I do want to go over the difference between encoder only and decoder only models. And I believe the reason why some of you are confused is because I introduced the transformer as it was inter originally introduced in 2017 as an encoder decoder transformer. And then I said, okay, but today you can use encoder part only or decoder part, but I don't think for some of you, it really kind of, you could visualize what is then stripped out of encoder decoder once you make it, let's say encoder only. So let's go over decoder only transformer and how we use it for pre-training and fine tuning. Uh, so let's start here at the bottom. Here is a given text to say, today we are learning about practicalities and we first tokenize this text as always different colors they refer to different uh, tokens. Here I use uh, tick token demo, which uh, is um, demo produced by OpenAI to show how they tokenize uh, text. And this is how the GPT-4 would tokenize this particular string. Important here uh, is that uh, you are finally seeing an example where we have those subwords that I keep mentioning. So practicalities is split into two uh, tokens, practical and ITIES, uh, uh, which makes sense. Um, and then each one of these tokens is transferred into its token ID in vocabulary. And what those IDs are used is to retrieve the rows in the embedding matrix, which um, I don't think really landed because uh, I this is, was a question in the midterm exam. And, um, and still, I don't see that we consistently are, you know, uh, referring to rows in an embedding matrix as referring to token embeddings of a uh, token with ID of that row. So uh, this is really important to remember. Since I mentioned midterm, I now probably uh, reminded you that it's not released yet, which I'm uh, a bottleneck. TAs did their job, but 
Um, I, I uh, obsessed a little bit with this uh, last uh, question where you were defining a neural network, uh, which I'm grading, and it's taking a little bit longer than I expected, but um, I'm hopeful that by tomorrow you will have your midterms graded. Um, so apologies for that. It's all on me being too slow with the grading. But going back to this, um, we have transferred now each one of these uh, tokens into IDs, and we use IDs to retrieve the corresponding rows in the, in, from the embedding matrix. And again, embedding matrix is a part of the transformer. It's not some other model where we are getting the embeddings from. And then we put it into our, this is decoder only model. So we are putting it into our decoder uh, layers. And here I just uh, said in free form language, what is happening with these token embeddings. Each one of them is being um, uh, becoming contextualized and non-linearly transform, uh, transformed. And important here is that when you are using decoder only transformer, you are using mask or causal attention. And that attention is uh, the one where you are never looking at the future tokens to adjust the uh, representation of a current token. You're only looking at the previous token to adjust the current token's representation, okay? Unlike in an encoder model, where we had bidirectional self-attention, where you looked into previous and future tokens to adjust a given token's representation. And you might ask yourself right now, well, isn't it better to look also in the future token if we are allowed to do that, for example, for classification? If I'm using decoder-only model for classification, not text generation, isn't that a really poor choice? And like, how come that decoder-only model had emerged as the most popular choice? And we'll come back to that question. Okay. Um, so that's one thing to really, really remember when we say decoder only model. Um, if uh, you remember, when we looked into encoder decoder transformer and we looked into decoder blocks, there was also something called encoder decoder attention or cross attention. Is this something we'll keep in decoder only model? Can someone tell me the answer and your explanation for your answer? The question is, do we have cross attention from decoder to encoder in a decoder only transformer? What would you say from the name decoder only? I don't think we did, but I'm very sure about the answer. Okay, that's fine. Do, can you explain why do you? Have a hunch it could be uh the answer could be no. Uh well if it's it's decoder only then where we get that classification from the way from the encoder. Exactly. So, yeah. There are no encoder blocks. And cross attention by definition is attention of decoder tokens to encoder tokens, but there is no concept of encoder or encoder tokens anymore. So we won't have cross intention in decoder only transformer. That's something we'll, which we will just get rid of because it's literally makes no sense to have. Yeah. Um, with the mask, do you only apply that as a train? And then like, so you do the forward pass, you mm -hmm. do the transformer layer, and you have the mask on for a train. And then when you're evaluating, you put in the mask, right? Do you want to look ahead? Okay, the question is, do we have mask attention only during training? Um, I will ask you back, why do you think that during testing it is allowed to look into the future tokens? That's fine. So no, you are not allowed to look at the future tokens be it during training or testing because with decoder only models, you are always going to, uh, during pre-training, and very often during fine tuning, do the next token prediction. And then um, it's simply uh, forbidden to predict the next token if you know what the next token is, right? So you are never allowed to look into the future tokens and with decoder only, you will always use mask attention. However, um, when I, I will try to remember 
your question when I say something about new classification head. And if I move forward and I don't come back to you, can you stop me and remind me that I wanted to say something and I will hopefully remember what I wanted to say. It's a little bit suspension. Um, okay, all right. So we have masked or causal attention after which we have those feed forward uh, layers. Uh, someone asked a good question uh, in Piazza. I borrowed some slides from transformers from someone else, and they are using the terminology multi-layer perceptron for feed forward neural uh, network. These things are the same, uh, just a different name. Uh, and our transformer these days, you will see it with the nonlinear function called uh, Jalu. Uh, and you are, you know, that's really unimportant. Uh, use Relu for your assignments, and it's sufficient to think about Relu when never, whenever we talk about transformers. Okay, another important thing for me to remember beyond the fact that we are always using mass or causal attention and that there is no cross attention with decoder only transformer is that always a semi final layer is a new token representation for every single token embedding. So there is always going to be a new token embedding for each one of the tokens. And during pre-training of decoder only transformers, we are using language modeling objective meaning that each one of these tokens will be classified uh, into uh, one of the possible tokens in the vocabulary. And the way we do that is by using, of course, linear transformation into a vector of the size of the number of tokens in the vocabulary. And then we apply softmax to get some notion of probability distribution over the vocabulary from which we can sample, right? Uh, so we'll have that, and with uh, decoder-only transformer, you will always use the representation of whatever is the last token so far uh, to make this prediction for the next token, okay? So if you are predicting what's going to happen after this one, you are going to use the representation of the final representation of the final token to make the decision. Is that clear? Okay, see some nodding on that side. How is the other side feeling? This is like a concert now you say. Uh, okay, less enthusiasm. Is there anything unclear here? Seems like maybe it's not not unclear, but it also it's not like you are super confident about what you're hearing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so. We are not doing prediction of the mask words here. So there is a confusion. Mask attention has nothing to do with predicting mask tokens. So let's make that clear. Pre-training objective, predicting the uh, mask token, mask language modeling is something we use with encoder only transformers and it's a pre-training objective. Masked attention is a type of self-attention where you are forbidden to look at the future tokens. And the way we have, again, we learned about this, so I will just make it very brief. Uh, the way we can do that is by calculating the self-attention matrix and then putting everything over the diagonal to be minus infinity, apply softmax, everything will be zeroed out above it. So just because word mask appears in these two concepts, don't, don't put them together, right? They are completely independent. Not independent, I would even say used in a very different scenario. So it's very risky to, to you know, combine them uh, together in your head. Yeah. Um, um, it might seem like you are disregarding them, and I will use a little bit mathy way of describing this, but each one of these is a function of the previous representation. So in a way, you are not discarding them because you would never be able to produce this one if you hadn't had the previous ones, right? Uh, so this one depends on the previous, on its own representations in previous layers, as well as on all of the other representations we have produced. But yeah, you're right that we are not using any of the other ones explicitly. So when we are finding the creation, 
Uh, again, gradients, uh, this is because this is a, what, what you get here is a function uh, whose output is a vector, but it's a function of, uh, which is a composition of many other functions that includes all of these other uh, representations uh, uh, from here to here to here, you know, like from previous tokens and previous layers. So when we do gradient computations due to the chain rule, we are going to propagate through all of these. Yeah, so again, I, maybe it seems like you're kind of using only this one and that's it, but because of the backdrop, everything yeah, will be touched. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like I see what you mean. Yeah, so for this visualization, we are talking about predicting the next token, which is the next token at this time. Yes. However, uh, you always start with the beginning of sequence token or you encode some initial text, and then you are generating one by one. And each time step, at each decoding step, you, you are calculating loss to get the you know um, training using the entire response. So just for the, this demonstration, I'm talking about predicting the next token, but you will predict next token as many times as you have decoded during your decoding step. Yes, please. You said that this class for him is a function of the class. Mm -hmm. But is it, that's what we did when we did um, encode the decoder with bottom ends. And you said that that was bottom end. Um, so, um, let me see how I will respond to this. Um, we, there was a mention of a bottleneck when we were talking about encoder decoder RNNs, where in encoder decoder RNNs, uh, you would um, make a representation of the entire source sequence using your encoder uh, computations. And eventually you would get only a single vector which would represent that entire source sequence, right? And then you would give that uh, as an initial hidden stage to the decoder, and then it would unfold the decoding steps. And the bottleneck here, the bottleneck I was referring to is that in this single vector representation, you have information about the source sequence, although at the different, different decoding step, some information about source sequence, for example, if you are decoding, starting to decode, the beginning of the source sequence is going to be important. If you are at the final stages of the decoding, the last tokens in the source sequence will become more important. And there was no this flexibility. Everything was always you had only a single vector. That was the bottleneck I was referring to. And then we introduced attention for RNNs to be able to have this flexibility, to have a representation of a source sequence which is specialized for every single um, decoding step. So that was about RNNs and their bottleneck issue. As soon as we switch to transformers, things have changed because now, instead of having that kind of attention, uh, uh, we had, and you know, in RNNs do not come with, by default with attention, you have to add attention to the RNN. Unlike transformers where this attention in the, is the core piece of the architecture, right? And the attention mechanism itself became a little bit more involved, where now you had for every token, you had the attention to other tokens, be it those tokens being a source or uh, target sequences. So I don't know whether I answer your question, but I think that you have connected the bottleneck from the RNNs to something that's not the issue here. Um, but maybe, Feel free to re-ask me if I didn't, didn't uh, answer your question. So, yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> You have to kind of acknowledge the role that these layers have played in transformers, where you had the 
self-attention. Remember, bottleneck we talked about was with uh, about was about RNS without any attention, right? So here you have self-attention, which is more complex than just attention, and you also have it, right? So uh, it's a completely different situation um, uh, than what you had uh, before. Um, just because we are making a decision from one vector doesn't mean that it's the same bottleneck as, as before. Um, yeah. Yeah, in a way you could think, well, your other way of asking your question could be like, how about averaging these representations and then making a next prediction based on the average of the final representations of everything we have seen so far. And there I would say, well, but what is the final token is actually more important about for predicting the next token. So there is some locality bias uh, over here that you do want to keep, right? For predicting the next token. Um, I said something now that maybe also triggered some thoughts with you. Like what if we do have conditional text generation, like machine translation? And how do we do that with uh, decoder only transformer where previously with encoder tra uh, decoder transformer, we use encoder to encode the source sequence and then had the uh, decoder to handle only decoding of the target sequence, right? So that might be confusing, but the, how we handle this is super simple. You are just plug your um, source sequence into your decoder layers and there will be some you know, representations over here. And you don't care what your output matrix would say the next token is, just ignore that. You are always going to put as, let's say your source sequence is four tokens long. The first to four tokens, the input will always be those source tokens. And then you start decoding. And you don't need to decode, uh, you don't need to use the decoding at the source tokens. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, of course. So the what I'm uh, explaining right now is how do we uh, handle conditional text, conditional text generation tasks with decoder-only transformers. So let's say source sequence is a sentence in English and we want to translate it into Croatian. And let's say the source sequence is, uh, how are you, question mark. So four tokens, let's imagine. What you would do by using decoder only transformers is put those four tokens. You first place the first one, which is uh, how you go through this and you get how. Then you have uh, how are, how are. Uh, so first is one is how, and then the second one is R. It also goes through the layers and you get a new representation for R. Uh, you again goes through it, you get new representation for you, and then question mark and you get the new representative for question mark. And now you can place a, a begin, begin generation sequence or something like that. So that goes through the uh, all the layers. And now here, when we have the final representation of begin generation special token, here we start to care about what the next token is. And this is where we take the representation of this token and we multiply it with the weight matrix, apply softmax, get the distribution over the vocabulary, and then uh, we get, um, we now have two options for training. Remember, we could actually add the token we had generated as the next token, or we can ignore for training purposes, the generated token and a place, whatever is on our human author data as the next token during training. And during test time, we would always need to place whatever token we have generated. So nothing has changed in terms of how we handle this. We just you know, uh, give source sequence through decoder layers, and that's it. We get the representations, everything we need, and then eventually we start decoding. So, uh, I think uh, there's like predictions that we just just not yeah, you can, uh, you, you know, you will likely, uh, your code will have forward pass, which gives you some probabilities for the next sequences. You will just ignore them because you literally don't care about them for the source sequence, right? You just care to get these representations 
because these representations and all that appeared below are necessary to compute new representations based on which the decoding will happen. So yeah, you're right. You will just ignore them, even they are there. Yeah. You just need to be careful when you calculate the loss to not accidentally include those probabilities in your loss calculation. So that was just a little tweak in the loss computation to ignore whatever loss would be for the first four tokens corresponding to source tokens. Okay, so now we have remembered what the pre-training looks like. Um, I'm personally very really happy we are doing this because I feel like this uh, uh, a lot of things are being clarified now, which is important. Once we are done with pre-training, so you know we have done this uh, next token prediction many times. Uh, something I didn't visualize here is that, okay, you have softmax here, but then uh, what, what is your supervision for pre-training with language modeling? It's whatever token had actually appeared in text next is going to be the one you use as gold label. And then you use your standard negative log likelihood or cross centropy, which are the same thing. Now, this is again, something I feel like totally didn't land with you. And that's what, how do we go about finding? And with decoder only models, you will have two options about how to go about fine tuning. The first option is to do the simplest possible thing and cast every task as a sequence generation task, right? And then you can reuse this uh, output matrix because you are generating the next token. So great, you are using it. And you are again predicting the next token and comparing to what you have in your data. And fine tuning again means we are changing the weights of the model. So when we do backprop, we are backpropagating through all these layers, including this output matrix over here. Okay. Another option is to ditch the or this weight matrix and include a new output layer, similarly like we did with encoder only models. And I wanna go over what this means. This is going to be often refers and as adding a new classification head. This is how we say it uh, in the field. And what does this mean is that, okay, you have your pre-trained output layer. This is the same thing I'm showing here. I just transposed the, the weight matrix. Um, so we have the output layer like this before. With adding a new classification head, you're saying, I do not want to use this output matrix. Instead, I'm going to replace it with a new output matrix, which will have the shape that I need for my classification task. For example, if you had two classes, you will have a new weight matrix of the shape D by two. And uh, you would randomly initialize it because that's all you can do and do the standard uh, way of making a prediction with neural network, as you have seen many, many times. Um, okay, if we do this, you might wonder what is the representation I'm gonna use? People still are gonna use the final tokens, final representation to represent the entire sequence. And this comes back to your question, is that sufficient? Like, is that in, does this capture enough information? Um, it must be if, you, if it empirically had shown to be worked, uh, but if you had other ideas like averaging all the final representation of all tokens, I don't think that would be by any means a poor choice uh, for these purposes. Um, I have also added here, so here, if you are using decoder only in Hugging Face, you will use auto model for causal LM. If you are now adding new classification head, you are going to use auto model for sequence classification, although you are using the same model name to load the weights from. If you are using auto model for sequence classification and give a name like GPT-2 uh, in Hugging Face, then Hugging Face will handle making this new output weight matrix for you. So you don't need to do that. And this is why it's important to choose the right uh, auto model class. Okay, so going back here, uh, we had one option, which, is, which was keep the output layer as it was during pre-training and just continue training further with new data you have. 
with a new classification layer, you are ditching this output weight matrix and you are adding new ones to make the classification simpler maybe, because now the output matrix is way, way, way smaller. Remember we had 30,000 tokens in our vocabulary. We, if you have only two classes, this uh, weight matrix becomes way smaller. Uh, again, um, with fine tuning, if you have a new classification head, the loss comes from this new output layer and it goes from here to here to all the other layers. So this one is not where we are back propagating through. This one is simply ignored. One thing to remember is that when you are doing prompting with decoder only models, you will never do this. You will never add a new classification head uh, because you have introduced new weights, which are random. And these weights can become good only if you have data to change them into something useful. So this approach is possible only if you are fine tuning your decoder only model. If you are prompting, which again means you are not changing the weights, then you will always choose this uh, option where you are reusing the output matrix for the reasons which should be obvious uh, uh, by now. Okay, questions about everything you're seeing here before we move to the encoder only models. Okay, pretty good. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. If so, if like, can you kind of teach me that not on this or like the top of the economy? Yeah. Or there should be like, uh, like it's not easy that we want to be part of the class in the study. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get your question. Can you can you say that? Can you say first a little bit more louder because I can't hear you and then be sorry to make you repeat it. Sounds like sounds good now. The whole model of metrics maybe like maybe not making that good progress because it's always good now to get to make style like starting from. I'm not sure I fully understand. So is your question that if we are choosing this option and then we have replaced uh, this weight matrix with this one, uh, whether the model can now learn well because we have removed this one? Is that the question or? Well, it can if you are fine tuning and given label data because then this matrix will become from that random matrix, a matrix which is specialized for the classification task. And be just cautious to not think we are ditching everything here. We are just ditching this layer over here. But you see how this new matrix is still using this representation, which comes from everything else in the transformer. So when you are computing your loss and back propagating, you are going from here to here, to here, 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 right? So you're still changing all the weights new weights and all the previous weights of your transformer model and specializing it for the task. And if you have labeled data, that's gonna work well. If you do not have labeled data, and this is why I said only here your prompting can only work with this option because this will never work if you don't have labeled data to uh, specialize the model and new weights. All right, so now uh, I will go over the by uh, encoder only transformer and how we pre-train them and fine tune them. So again, you will do your tokenization and changing into IDs and then using IDs to retrieve rows uh, in the embedding matrix. However, with almost all encoder only transformers that are pre-trained, you will see these special tokens called CLS and separator tokens. So here at the beginning, you need to add CLS token for as name suggests for classification and separator token at the end, which is used to uh, kind of separate two different types of texts. So for example, if you had question answering in the context of passage, what people would do would have CLS, then passage tokens, then separator, then question tokens, then another separator. So you can use separator to kind of separate different types of uh, texts. Um, then you encode them. And now with encoder transformer, we have our self-attention, which is allowed to look into the future tokens. 
that's allowed with the encoder uh, transformer. You have that, so standard self-attention, multi-headed, mask, so mask attention was also multi-headed, don't forget that. So three forward layers, everything uh, that you know of. Yeah. Yeah, we are talking about encoder now. Yeah, so if we if we if you skipped a bit when I said we have switched to encoder only models, this is now about encoder only transformers. And then um, you have new final token embeddings for each one of your token uh, tokens in the input. And we use mask language modeling objective to pre-train encoder only transformers. Meaning we have uh, picked one of these tokens uh, at the beginning. For example, I pick here R uh, to be, um, I replaced it with a mask, special mask token, uh, which is not visible here, but imagine that R is replaced by word mask. And then the goal was given this new representation over here to predict what the mask token was in the corpus. And here again, we have a, an output layer, which is of the same shape as before with the decoder only and language modeling. But the objective is actually quite different. Uh, predicting the next token and predicting the mask token are simply doing different things. Um, so here, because the model just need to predict the mask not to continue its uh, generation so far, it will actually not be a good model for text generation. And you might uh, question me and say, well, what if I have as a mask, you know, my final token is a mask token, and then the model needs to predict what the next token is. While that might work with some proficiency, it will never be as good as if you pre-train the model with the language modeling objective, which has been empirically shown. So, Mask language modeling and language modeling, although very alike, are quite different when it comes for our then downstream purposes, okay? So this is what we do with pre-training. And then with, uh, with um, using encoder-only pre-trained transformers, the only option you have is to uh, fine-tune them. There has been some initial prompting attempts with these kind of models, but as you can imagine, given what the visualizations with those three branches I showed you, it was way more inefficient than prompting by using language modeling or next token prediction. So when you're using encoder only transformers that are pre-trained, almost always you will use them to uh, when you have labeled data and you want to fine tune them for classification not generation tasks, not generation because due to the mask language modeling objective, it's always going to, these models are always going to be subpar compared to decoder only models that are trained with language modeling objective, which are always going to be better choice for you if you are doing text generation. So you take your pre-trained model with, um, with encoder only pre-trained model, when you're fine tuning them, you're always going to use new classification head. You're always going to ditch the pre-trained output layer you have. You're going to introduce new ways to do the classification just as we have seen it with the uh, decoder only models. One major difference as well is that you are almost always going to use the token, the final token embedding for the special CLS token as a representation of the entire sequence on based on which you will do the classification. Whereas previously we have used the final representation of the final token to be the one we made the new classification uh, based on. Okay, so little test for you. <clears throat> on the left and right, these two figures are two different transformer architectures. So not one, two different transformer architecture. So, can you raise a hand if you know which one is encoder only and which one is decoder only? Everyone who knows the difference can raise a hand. And if you don't know, don't raise your hand. Okay, half, half, I would say. Um, I will pick one of you who usually don't speak a lot. Can you, can you explain all the way in the back behind? No, yeah, I meant, sorry, you in the pinkish, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, and uh, I didn't hear the last bit after it has mass contention and it takes output uh, in bedding. Okay, yes, perfect. So um, I would say this uh, this is um, here, um, the, the way why it's written output embedding. I mean, sure it is, um, you know, there are some outputs and we are decoding them, but uh, I wouldn't say that's a, that's a major uh, difference between these two. The major difference is that here we have mask self-attention and uh, here we have, um, uh, we have just multi-headed attention, which if there is no mask um, emphasized, usually it would just mean it's bi-directional. So, um, yeah, the major difference between these two is just in the attention part. And I think this is really important for you to know. If you haven't started uh, implementing your third assignment, or if you have, maybe you have noticed that how slightly your encoder implementation differs when you want to apply it for the next token prediction, the second part of your assignment. So because we have removed the cross attention from the decoder only transformer, because we can literally not have it as we don't have the encoder, the only difference is in how we use the uh, self-attention, where in one part is mask and the other part uh, is not. Okay, now I'm going back to your question about uh, can we look into the future token? And I say, no, never look into the future tokens with decoder only attention. And I still stand by that answer. That's always gonna be the case. But you might wonder, okay, if I'm using new classification head at top of my pre-trained uh, representations coming from my decoder only transformer, obviously now I'm doing classification and the fact that I'm looking into future tokens doesn't matter, right? Like now that's allowed because I'm not doing text generation task and I have new output layers that are designed for classification. You still don't want to do it because your pre-trained weights have seen a lot of attention matrices which have zeros above the triangle. Triangle, And if you would now allow that those uh, values are non-zero, you're introducing a so-called out of distribution problem for your architecture because suddenly where we had all zeros, we have some numbers. So you still don't wanna do it. But then you might ask me, well, okay, if I have a classification task and I have, I have labeled data, I can use encoder only transformer or decoder only and add new classification heads at top of um, either of these. Why would decoder only with the um, new classification head be any better than encoder only? And most likely it's not gonna be massively different, but maybe the question could also be like, why does it work comparable to the encoder only that can see the future and also has a new classification head? And this is something that people have shown empirically that actually masked attention and being able to look only at the previous tokens actually is sufficient relative to, for classification task, if you can go both ways. But uh, decoder-only models are going to scale slightly more nicely. And here I will explain, uh, I will try to explain uh, like one efficiency advantage of masked attention relative to the bi-directional one. So um, here you have a input, how are you? And also how are you? Bidirectional self-attention refers to the standard self-attention where you can look into uh, before and after tokens. Unidirectional refers to the one where you can look only at the previous tokens. Uh, remember this uh, bidirectional versus unidirectional attention terminology, it's important. Here, um, you can see by arrows that here you, you look, each token looks at all of them and here only at the past ones. Now, if you are uh, doing a uh, uh, multi-turn generation, so now your assistant responds to your prompt, what happens with that, with those new tokens? Here, what needs to happen is that your representation of the token how here will now need to be recomputed because self-attention is going to change everyone's representations because we allow that. However, with unidirectional attention, here, this representation of how will always stay the same because you are never allowed to look at the future tokens, no matter how many new ones you decoded. 
only representations that now need to be computed are those for the new tokens, right? So for example, here you can cache representation for your prompt, and then you can create the representation for the next token, which you cannot do with uh, bidirectional uh, attention. So in the terms of engineering, unidirectional or mask attention is better because you can make the computations more efficient. If you can make something more efficient, you can scale it better. And scaling so far had resulted in better performances and we have yet not um, reached the so-called wall where you scale the model further and you don't get improvements. Okay, so kind of to wrap, why is the decoder only transformer a go-to architecture for the latest LLMs? First of all, everyone wants to produce now general purpose tasks, uh, LLMs like ChatGPT, where your LLM can do all sorts of tasks. And the fact that you have next token prediction during pre-training, fine tuning and prompting is nice because everything is shared, the entirety of the transformer architecture. Whereas with encoder only transformer, we can see in mask language modeling, which is not really what you can then reuse for many purposes later on. Decoder only uh, are simpler than encoder decoder. You, you can say, well, the encoder decoder also generates tokens. So why not use encoder decoder? Um, it turned out that encoding source sequence in some special manner is not so important. And decoder only is obviously simpler architecture, which again is associated with better scaling. We have actual proof they are scalable. So someone, namely OpenAI, had chosen decoder-only architecture as their architecture. They scaled it really well, and they got all these performances. And now you have a proof that scaling this architecture type works. So if it works, why change it, right? Like, you just go with it. And then what I have showed you is more or less anecdotal report that this unidirectional uh, mask attention is sufficient compared to the bidirectional. So even bidirectional gives you richer representation. Turns out that with unidirectional mask attention, you get good enough representation to do stuff the type of ChatGPT can do. Um, so I tried my best to now again revisualize encoder only, decoder only, encoder, decoder. I'm linking here recording and slides of someone else that I found to be potentially useful. So if you need yet another way of visualizing everything, so feel free to uh, check these slides uh, too. But I hope at this point encoder or only decoder only or encoder, decoder transformer is much clearer than we have seen uh, before. Okay, uh, I will move forward with other practicalities, but let's see, are there any questions? Okay, cool. So I've showed you uh, LLM's categorization with respect to the architecture type with that nice looking tree, right? We had those three branches. Another way of uh, thinking about LLM landscape is whether the LLM is proprietary, meaning its weights are not shared with everyone, or they are open weight. I also want to say open weight is not the same as open model, because you can release your weights but not give information about the data, not release the data, not release the code. Only when you release all of that, then you have a fully open LLM. This is a, actually a nice figure from uh, October 2024, very, uh, very recent. And here you are seeing different large language models that have been released in the past uh, two years or so. With the red dots, you are seeing models that are proprietary. They are closed weight models. With green dots, you are seeing open weight models. The performance on uh, x-axis, you are seeing uh, the date when they were released. So from 2022 to something super recent. And on I-axis, you'll see performance on this benchmark called MMMU. It has its own issues, but it's a benchmark a lot of people will use today to report that their model is, their LLM is better or sub, you know, comparable to some other LLM. Um, and when we look at this visualization, what you can see is that all of this, there was a massive gap previously with open weight and closed weight models. This gap, at least in terms of the performance on this MMLU benchmark, is becoming closer 
with LAMA 3.5405 billion being very close to close 3.5 sonnet by Anthropic. So there, that's another thing to kind of now keep in mind when you are thinking about which model, which LLM should I choose for my own purposes? Or you are hired and your uh, manager asks you, hey, what do you think, what should we use for this problem? You should kind of, you know that ChatGPT is quite powerful. You know that API exists and that you certainly know how to code uh, the code you need to use the API. But you should also know, you know, keep in mind that open weight models are right there. And um, what would be the benefits of using open weight model for you and the company you are working for, or if you're in a research setting for your research question. Okay, so I will keep in mind, keeping this in mind, I will give you um, a protocol I think is reasonable for thinking about which which way to go if uh, you have a classification task or text generation task, like uh, what should you do? Which kind of models you should be using? So let's say you have classification task. Uh, first question you need to ask yourself is, do I have labeled data set or yeah, I, there is no data, data set I could use, right? So this is the first question you ask. And if your question to, do I have labeled data? The answer is no. You should also ask yourself, well, is labeled data possible to be created, right? Like maybe you don't need ton of training instances and maybe it's not super terribly complicated task. Maybe the it's quite objective in terms of the categorization and something you can imagine either um, recruiting actual people and asking them to do is totally viable. Or maybe these days you will also see GPT-4 as a way to create data. If you are opting for the GPT-4 creating your data, you must uh, take a sample of that data, 100 or more instances and you or someone else needs to label those instances and you need to compare your agreement with GPT-4. If you have super high agreement on which how to label that text, then you can say, well, I have some evidence that GPT-4 uh, can serve as a proxy for a human annotator in this case. Okay, so no matter how you ended up having your labeled data, if you have a classification task, if you have labeled data, then you have an option to fine tune your model. And if you fine tune, again, means changing the weights, it must be an open weight model. Otherwise, how would you change the weights, right? And for classification tasks, you can use encoder only transformer like BERT or the BERTA. Or you can use encoder decoder models like T5 or Flan T5, or decoder only models like GPT-2, Llama, Quen, Mistral, and so on. If you fine tune a model, you can choose to do it by adding a new classification head. Again, that means ditching the old pre-trained output layer and replacing it with a new randomly initialized output layer. And uh, yeah, training, the new layer together with all of the transformer weights. Remember, when you fine tune transformer, you always change all of the weights, okay? Unless if you want to do some kind of efficient uh, training, which we'll learn uh, uh, soon. If you are adding new classification head, then in hugging phase, you are going to use auto model for sequence classification. However, if you are dealing with encoder, decoder, or decoder-only models, remember that another option is to reuse the output layer and frame all of your tasks as sequence-to-sequence -sequence task, although they are classification tasks, you are doing the uh, prediction as next token prediction. For encoder, decoder models, you are going to use auto model for sequence-to-sequence -sequence LM. For decoder-only in high degree phase, you are going to use auto model for causal LM. All right. Questions before I move to no label data branch? Pretty good, thanks, appreciate that. <laughs> if labeling data is not feasible and you don't have it, then you can prompt open weight or proprietary instruction fine tune 
encoder, decoder, or decoder-only transformer. So let's break this out. Now, why can you prompt proprietary models or open weight is because um, you don't really need the weights, but sure, if there are weights available, that doesn't stop you from prompting the model. Why does it need to be instruction fine-tuned? It needs to be instruction fine-tuned because I told you that in 2020, when we had models that were not instruction fine-tuned, they were not capable of following instructions and therefore you couldn't prompt them well, right? So you are always going to choose a model that had been specialized for instruction following. So for example, here, notice how I ditched T5. That's because it's not instruction fine-tuned. Flan T5 is instruction fine-tuned. I also ditched GPT-2 because it's not instruction fine-tuned, okay? And then you might ask, well, uh, why encoder, decoder, or decoder only, and why not encoder only? Remember that uh, with prompting, you need to reuse the output layer you had before. And remember, I told you that mask language modeling is simply not good for uh, as, a, as a mean to try to do many of these tasks later on. So you need models that were pre-trained with language modeling objective. And those can be encoder, decoder, or decoder only uh, models because there is an actual decoder in play. And if you decide to prompt, then of course you need to reuse the language modeling output layer. You don't have other option and you need to use these uh, auto model classes, okay? All right, so now what if your task is generation task, inherently generation task, like summarization, generating a summary, or um, I don't know, what else is, a, is inherently generation task? Um, I am sure I know more tech generation task. Machine translation, for example. So here, main thing that have changed, if I do it slowly, is that this part disappeared, right? It just, it's gone. And that part was part which was associated with encoder only models. It's simply not the case you would use encoder only models for text generation. And the reason is because you have models that are specialized for next token generation and they will simply be better than encoder only. It's not the case that it's impossible to use encoder only. It's just the case that it's almost certainly gonna be worse than decoder only transformer models. So if you see 2018 papers using BERT for summarization, remember that at that time, we didn't have strong decoder only models. So people have used best they have, right? But try to find summarization paper that uses BERT today, you will have a very hard time, okay? So this thing disappeared. And otherwise, everything stays the same. You can fine tune open weight model, be it encoder, decoder, or decoder only. And you can uh, prompt open weight or proprietary instruction fine tuned and aligned, potentially decoder only model. Um, why did I ditch encoder, decoder models here? Um, I ditched them because for text generation, when you don't have data, um, it's, I'm, prompting will require that you have a very strong decoder model. And it's just the case that at some point, encoder decoder models were not those that are scaled anymore. So in this landscape of LLMs, you will use something that was released in 2020, uh, 2024. So this year um, to prompt for text generation and this is going to be likely decoder only model. I'm also unaware of any encoder decoder model that's aligned with human feedback. And for many cases, you do want alignment for text generation. It's not crucial, but remember, you don't want any of the weird stuff being generated, right? So very often you need the aligned uh, versions. And uh, all the aligned models I know are decoder only model. Here, I also intentionally wrote uh, LAMA twice. So LAMA is an open weight model, large language model produced by Meta. And it started with just LAMA. Then there was a new uh, state, a new, you know, kind of, as there is GPT-2, 3, and 4, now they had LAMA 2 and LAMA 3.1. Uh, be cautious when you use uh, LAMAs in Hugging Face because they slightly change their uh, terminology. So here you see chat and here you see instruct. 
both of them are referring to these um, both instruction fine-tuned and aligned version, uh, but th they somehow changed the name, I guess, to follow what everyone else was using, which is instruct. Um, and some models that I personally recommend at this point of times are Lama 3.1, Quent 2.5, and Mistral uh, Large. Okay, so that's about generation task. Little has changed relative to the previous slide for classification, no encoder only models. And here, unlike here, where alignment wasn't super important because you're not generating anything, here alignment becomes more important. Okay, now for prompting, remember that you had various options. You could do zero shot prompting where you just give an instruction and the instance for which you want the model to do something for. We had in-context learning where we had few shots, a few demonstrations of the task as part of the prompt. And we had chain of thought prompting where we had also given a few examples together with the explanation for why the answer is whatever the answer is. And we are eliciting the model to provide us not only the answer, but also explanation in plain language, like plain English. We talked about these three different approaches, but I also want to remind you that because prompt engineering had emerged as this massive thing in 2020, then uh, we have covered only very few methodologies for prompting models, those in realm of zero shot, few shot, and third generation. But I shared this paper with you and I recommend checking, uh, checking it out. It's really good where you have way more, you know, category. There are three more categories and then way more algorithms for how to go about, uh, you know, prompting models to do something. Um, if you are interested in maybe the cutting edge stuff, of course, that would be these over here, especially everything related on uh, kind of marrying the standard AI algorithms like search with this uh, chain of thought prompting. So for example, tree of thoughts uh, is something that people speculate has been really relevant for the latest model OpenAI had released or one preview. Okay, there are a few other things I want to, I want to use the time to finish with a few other practical considerations. Um, as slide says here, it's an input context length. And uh, I want to just talk a little bit about like, okay, if I want to use API or open weight model, what kind of things I should have uh, in mind. So these are things we haven't talked about before, unlike everything we have talked about so far today, uh, which might be like, really, did we? <laughs> um, are there any questions because before we move forward? My goal is that we are all understanding now what large language models are relative to bringing more content for you. Okay, stop me, stop me if you remember something. So one thing you will see uh, when we, people talk about large language models is the input context length. Um, how many tokens can we give provide to the, uh, to the model? And in theory, you could provide as many tokens as you are as you want, right? Because you're, pro for example, with decoder only models, you're just progressively making these uh, new representations and decoding next token. But remember the issue of generalization, the issue where uh, we want models to perform well for new stuff. If you are providing way more tokens than the model has seen during pre-training, it's going to start to be confused and you will not see good performance. Okay, so when people release new large language models, if we are happy enough that you share something with us, they might mention, how, what was the maximum sequence length that they have used during pre-training? And this value is what people referred as the input context length. And it also became as one of these most important things that people are reporting when they are reporting uh, their, you know, information about their new language models because uh, it's really, really relevant. Um, okay. So first there is that, um, how the input context length being, how, what's the maximum input sequence length that uh, creators of an LLM had given to their LLM during pre-training. Um, 
Let me go over a few things. I will try to put them together nicely. First, I will give you two pieces of information that seemingly are irrelevant to each other. And then I will put them together in an argument that ties back to the input context slide. The first thing to remember is that your attention matrix is quadratic in the maximum sequence length, right? So attention matrix is if n is a sequence length, the shape of the attention matrix is n by n which means if the length of an input sequence doubles, the amount of memory required quadruples. So training an LLM on sequences of lengths of 128,000 will require over uh, 1,000 times more memory compared to training with sequences of length just 4K. 4K was something we've seen, for example, with LAMA 2, so just last year. 128,000 is what we see with most large language models today, if not more. And why do we care about memory? Remember that we are bounded by the joint memory we have on our GPUs, right? So if your sequence is so long that it requires certain amount of memory to produce attention metrics and store it on the GPUs, and you don't have that memory on your GPUs, you cannot train with your GPUs. And training without GPUs is ridiculously slow and out of the uh, consideration. Okay, so that's one thing to know about. Then completely other thing that's seemingly unrelated is our positional embeddings. Remember that each one of the token embeddings in Transformer is not just represented by token embedding that captures lexical semantics of that token, but also another embedding, which uh, is um, considering its position in the sequence such that when we do self-attention, we are considering, oh, this is that token that appear in the first position, for example. The I didn't talk much about positional encodings because it's a whole other lecture that I would need to explain it. What I did mention is that rope is the most common choice today. And what is important to know about rope, it's that actually in the self-attention matrix, it's going to be adding some values such that when we measure the importance between two tokens, uh, we also consider what is the relative distance between them. So if you, have, if you are computing how important is the first token for the 10 token, you are also capturing that these two tokens are 10 positions apart. So this is what rope does, and it is more effective than anything else we have right now. Uh, but the issue is that rope is going to break apart if you start giving sequences which are uh, so far, like certain tokens are so far away from each other, way more far away uh, from each other than what the model has seen during pre-training. So if the creator of an LLM is uh, using maximum sequence length of 128,000, the, the biggest dif distance you can see between two tokens is 128,000, right? Now, if you start generating more tokens and the distance becomes 2 million, your model is going to be confused. And when the model is, going to co is confused, it's not going to work well. Okay, so the thing I want you to remember, in theory, you can process as many tokens you want. There isn't like that matrix that's of the shape where one dimension is 128,000 that forbids you to extending things further. It's not, an, it's not that that's the case. You can still put longer sequences into your decoder only model. It's just the case that um, rope, which is applied to the self-attention matrix is gonna start to become useless for those longer sequences. So you are stuck with whatever is the maximum sequence length your uh, creators of LLMs had chosen for you. And let me finish just by showing you some numbers here in this visualization. Unfortunately, the creator had decided to show only proprietary models except BERT here. Uh, but you can see that 2018, we could uh, fit only 512 tokens, kind of sad. Today, the largest we can, uh, quantity we can fill into model is 2 million tokens in Gemini 1.4 Pro, which is huge. If you don't know how huge these numbers uh, are, the same person have provided this nice visualization. So 128 tokens, which is not only with uh, something that GPT-4 Turbo, for example, can process, but also your favorite new open weight models like Llama, 
Quen and Mistral. They can process 128,000 tokens, and that is basically first Harry Potter and a bit of the second. 200 tokens is almost two first Harry Potters. Gemini 2.2 uh, million is a whole uh, series of Harry Potter books, plus almost all of the Lothar. This is enormous. I am shocked. I mean, this is something that I personally can't believe that progress has been so major that we went for 512 uh, to to processing entire books and not only like like 10 substantial uh, books to this day. So this is this is kind of spectacular, I would say. But have in mind that just the fact that you can put a, all of these books into the model doesn't mean that the model effectively processes them in a sense of if you ask questions about all of these books and that requires reasoning across many of them, this is a line of work that's still very lacking in the research and it's an open research question, how to do processing of extremely long sequences really, really well. Okay, I'll stop here and then I will shuffle the schedule around a little bit to actually cover multilingual models.